Luke chapter 3, verses 9. The theme of our today's conversation is holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Now, I need to put a disclaimer here and say this is one of those very difficult sermons. Um, I'll beg your indulgence and I'll ask you to forgive me in advance. Praise Jesus. It's going to be a hard one because uh, there are things we need to, to fix, whether individually, family level, the place of work, ministry level, and sometimes it takes such kinds of instructions in teachings to fix certain things. So the someone I'm going to share today is uh, someone I'm supposed to minister among ministers. But uh, you guys have a privilege that I teach you things here that even ministers don't do or don't have a grasp of. Praise God. So when Paul is asking Timothy to appoint leaders in the church, uh, uh, so Apostle Paul commands or instructs Timothy to appoint bishops, elders and deacons in the churches that are he had planted. Um, one of those one of those very hard. In fact, when it comes to deacons, he gives a very hard, a very hard qualification for one to qualify to be a deacon. By the way, it was very hard in the early church to be a deacon, praise God. Uh, uh, that it is today. It's so easy to be an apostle. Uh, uh, you're laughing. It's so easy today to be an apostle. Praise God. Amen. In the early church, it was so hard to be a deacon. And yet deacons are the ones who used to, to serve on the tables, right? Yes. Today, deacons will be the ones ushering, right? Yes. Uh, they will be the ones maybe sweeping the church, cleaning the church, making sure that the church is clean, making sure that people are seated well, you know, running those uh, uh, the, 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 the things like uh, what uh, Doris does, you know. Those are the, those are works that were made for deacons, uh, because deacons were basically supposed to help uh, uh, pastors uh, or apostles uh, function better, so that the apostles were supposed to focus on the ministry of word and prayer, right? Not uh, 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 on the ministry, or not that uh, not that apostles cannot do the work of tables, but it was important for them to concentrate on word and prayer. A uh, 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 certain men are appointed to help them uh, uh, do the ministry's nitty gritties and administrative uh, 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 um, errands. So, um, in giving qualifications for deacons in First Timothy, I want us to go there. Verses nine. Actually, let me read from verse eight. It says, "Likewise, that is." 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8. Uh, he says, Likewise, must the deacon be grave, not double tank. That's a hard one already. This one would disqualify, maybe. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Amen. He says, Not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy rule. Then verses 9, he says, uh, Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. And then he says, let this be also first proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. He says, even so, their wives be great, not slanderous, sober, Faithful in all ways. Then it says, let the deacon be a husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree. In other words, degrees can be purchased, right? They are good degrees. Okay. You guys did not get the job. It's okay. And a great boldness in the faith 
which is in Christ Jesus. But our focus today is that statement there. For you or for one to qualify to serve in the early church or in the body of Christ, huh? for anybody who was supposed to be a waiter, because that's what deacons were. They were supposed, you see like in, in, host, in, in, in hotels we have waiters. They wait on what? They wait on people. That's what deacons were supposed to do. They were supposed to wait on people, on the aisles, to help people, to direct people, to, 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 to run those uh, ministries' errands, you understand? He, he says that for anyone to qualify to be a waiter, not a minister, you understand that? Not a what? Not a minister. Not one who stands behind the pulpit to preach or to share the word. That the, the, he also gave later the qualifications of an elder or bishops, men who are supposed to stand behind the pulpit to administer the word. He's talking about people who serve from the other side, and the qualifications that he gives uh, uh, for people who are supposed to serve from the other sides uh, would even disqualify men who are serving from this side. You understand? Who disqualify? There are things that disqualify men. <laughs> but also there's a place where God qualifies men who are disqualified. But there are things that disqualify men. So he says that for one to qualify to serve in church or in ministry as a waiter, not as a minister, because of course these waiters were ministers. Don't uh, be mistaken. Even a waiter is a what? Is a minister. But he's not ministering from the same space or place uh, uh, the man of God ministers from. You understand? But is it not strange that if you look at the deacons in the early church, they did so mightier things uh, than things that even pastors cannot do. Like for example, let's talk about Stefano, right? He was a deacon. This is a man who, history tells us, uh, he would go into the war, into the streets and heal the sick. He was a deacon, Stefano. He used to heal the sick. Stefano has records of raising the dead. He was a deacon. But the man, if you look at the qualification to be a deacon from act, it's supposed, it's supposed to be a man, man of faith and one who is filled with the Holy Ghost. So there were men of faith and men of the Holy Ghost. So they walked spaces and places, they healed the sick, they raised the dead, they, they caused the cripple to walk, and yet they were waiters in the church. Yet they were waiters in the church. And yet they did so mighty things outside the church. Even though in the church they were considered men who do those little jobs, manual jobs. So, when Apostle Paul says that a deacon or anybody who seeks to serve in church must be one who holds the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. What does it mean? And I want us to start there. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. This teaching has like two parts. The part of holding the mystery of faith. Because mystery of faith is a different sermon. And then pure conscience is a different sermon. So I'll try today to labor to help us understand what it means to hold the mystery of faith. What it means to behold the mystery of faith. Deacons were supposed to be men who behold or who hold to the mystery of faith. If a man does not hold or behold the mystery of faith, they did not qualify to serve even as deacons. Praise the name of the living God. Amen. So what does it mean? Because I want us to explain to explain to us these two words very fast and then I go to my sermon. What does it mean to hold to hold our faith? To hold the mystery of faith. What does it mean to hold the mystery of faith? And then what does it mean to have a pure conscience? Now, to hold also means to demystify the mystery, which also means uh, to reveal. There were supposed to be men who could reveal what faith is. There were supposed to be men who carried the revelation of faith. They could reveal faith. Because if faith is not revealed to a man, a man cannot live by faith. 
If faith is not revealed to you, you cannot live by faith. That's why many of us are struggling in our walk of faith, huh? because faith has not been revealed to us. We still live by what we see. We still live by our natural senses, what we hear with our own. So you hear that somebody said, and then you believe it. It basically means you're a carnal man, a one who hears what he hears with his ears and believes because he has heard. Men of faith don't believe things they hear with their ears. They believe things they hear with their spiritual what? Yes. Their spiritual ears. So men of faith don't just believe because they have seen. No. You don't believe because you see. You see because you've done what? You have believed. So men of faith are men who faith has been revealed to them. And they relate with God not on the basis of their natural senses, not taste. So food is not nice because it tastes nice in your mouth. No. There are men who have learned how to live beyond natural senses. So he says this, this must be men who behold, who faith is revealed to them. The Bible said they just shall live by faith and not by sight. This scripture, church, will disapprove many because many of us have not learned what it means to live by faith. We still live by sight. We still live by how we feel. Let me tell you, some of us, if we listen to how we were feeling, we would not be preaching. On Thursday, on Thursday, something hit me. And I did not know if I was going to wake up in the morning. And yet I slept saying over and over that I cannot be sick. My body is on fire and I refuse even for a moment to acknowledge that I am sick. Because I'm not going to be moved by how I feel. Praise God. Amen. How I feel is not going to move me. I'm not moved by how I feel. I can feel whatever I'm feeling, but that is not who I am. Praise God. So if you listen to how you're feeling, you don't go to church. The poor not come to church today because they listen to how? They're feeling. They're, they listen to how they're feeling yesterday when they went to sleep. Now, those are men who cannot walk by faith. Those are men who faith has not been revealed to. When men, when faith is revealed to men, it doesn't matter how you feel. You are not moved by your feelings. It doesn't matter what you hear. You are not moved by what you hear. It doesn't matter what you see. You are not moved by what you see. It doesn't matter how it tests. You are not moved by what it tests. Praise God. So, when we talk about holding the mystery of faith. It means faith has to be revealed. In other words, he says, for you to serve as deacon, you must be one whom faith has been revealed to. And let me tell you, listen, faith has so many dimensions. Faith has so, so, so many dimensions. There are people who faith has been revealed in part. There are people who faith has been revealed in full. Listen, we all don't see in the spirit uh, uh, from the same one places, right? And same spaces. Give me the scripture, First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 9. First Corinthians. Paul says, 13, right? He says that, uh, for we know in part. You see? He says we know in part. There are people who know in part. There are people who see in part. Because faith has dimensions. Faith can be revealed to you in so many dimensions. There are people who see what you don't see. But it does not mean what you see is wrong. But they don't see from where you see. There are people who see from very inferior dimensions. There are people who see from very superior dimensions. So he says that, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Because there are men who carry the perfect vision.
definition of what faith is. And then there are people who carry very imperfection, imperfect visions of what faith. That's why if you read, there's a story in Mark. So Jesus lays a what? A hands on a man, right? Who was blind, right? And then he asks the man, what do you see? Remember? What did the man see? He says, men look like what? But you see, the man was doing what? You're seeing. At least the man was seeing. But he was not seeing men the way other men see other men. He was seeing. Listen, listen, this man, this man had been blind. So when his eyes are open, the first thing he sees are men, but men look like trees. Then he's touched again, and now he sees perfectly. Why? Because that place in him that was still imperfect has been removed up because he could only see men in part. Now he sees men fully. Now when he sees men fully, he sees men for what they are. Praise the name of the living God. Amen. So it's very, it's very important for us and for you that you are established in the revelation of faith. Because if a man cannot be established in the revelation of faith, that man cannot walk with God. That's why we have Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the hall of faith. It talks about men who faith was revealed to. Hebrews 11 was written for men who carried the revelation of faith. Men who knew what it means to walk by what? Faith. By faith. A man one day wakes up. And he decides he's going to leave his father and mother. And he's going to a place he has never been. And yet because, because, because he could not be moved by what... You, you see some of us cannot move easily, right? right? Because we fear, right? We fear the unknown. We, we, we carry the feelings of the fear of unknown. So we were supposed to have moved long time ago, but we cannot move because we are held back by the dynamics of the places we were supposed to go. Or what could happen to us if we go where we are supposed to go? So a man wakes up one day and he leaves his father and his mother and he goes to a nation he did not know, a nation he had never been to. And from there, God blesses that man. If Abraham listened to his feelings, he could have never done what? He could have never moved. Praise God. Amen. But number two, there's another part there called pure conscience. A pure conscience, and this is very important. Church, I want us to start here. And this is why I say that you have to forgive me because I'm going to say very hard things huh, that could offend many of us. But either way, either way I'm okay. Praise God. A pure conscience is a conscience without issues or a conscience that is void of offense between God and man. A pure conscience is a conscience that is void of issues or void of offense between God and men. Now, listen. In Acts chapter 24, Apostle Paul says something profound here then. And this is a scripture you should take time to labor, to carry, and this has helped me a lot. In verse 16, he says, and herein I do exercise myself, he says, to always have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. A pure conscience is a conscience that is exercised not to be offended by God nor men. When a man has a pure conscience, we are talking about a person who cannot be offended by God and who cannot be offended by men. If you are easily offended by men, then you have a defiled conscience. Now, a man of a defiled conscience cannot walk by faith. If your husband can easily offend you, if your wife can easily offend you, if people around you can easily offend you, they can easily offend you because your conscience is defiled. And a man whose conscience is defiled cannot walk by faith. Let me tell you, we are living in a, in a generation that easily is what? Is offended. And let me tell you, there is a danger... There is a danger 
to being easily offended. A man called Moses was appointed by God to lead the children of Israel from Egypt into the promised land. The man died halfway because he was offended. I have said this before, that offense can curtail a man's destiny. There are people who are dead today because they were offended yesterday by somebody. Let me tell you, offense is such a big thing in the Bible that you will do anything in the world not to be easily offended. That's why Apostle Paul says, I hereby do exercise myself to always, not sometimes, always have a conscience void of offense towards God. In other words, even if God does not come through for me when I expected him to come through for me, I'll not carry an offense against God. Because there are men who easily do right? You understand? There are people who can easily be offended by God because when God was supposed to come through for them, he didn't come through for them. And they would question God. They would ask a million questions and be offended with God. And they would throw tantrums to God. And sometimes, yes, there's a guy who keeps saying, tell God how you feel. Have you heard people say, tell God how you want? Let me say, tell you. You keep telling God how you feel. God, does not, God is not moved by your feelings. You keep telling him how you feel. He is not moved by your feelings. God is only a respecter of faith, right? He is not a respecter of your feelings. You can cry how long you want to cry. God is not moved by men's tears. God is moved by men's faith. We were taught to tell God our feelings. But let me tell you, God is not moved by men's feelings. God is moved by faith. Praise God. Buana Sifiwe. We are, generally, sorry, we are a generation that is easily offended. A few weeks ago, we had visitors here. And let me get personal a bit here. Because this someone is an apostolic. Because I need to correct some of us. We had visitors here. And in the midst of visitors, I forgot to acknowledge one of our members who had disappeared for some time. You understand? Mm -hmm. Like today we have biggies, right? So I forgot to say... Biggie, welcome back. <laughs> I forgot to say, Lucy, it's good to see you. I forgot to say, Celine, it's good to have you. And this person is not coming back to church because I forgot to acknowledge them. Because they are offended. Because they are offended that the pastor did not acknowledge them after that been awake for a long time. <laughs> God forgive you. <laughs> and I'm like, God, what's going on? What do you mean? At least I know two. I know two, I know two people who are not coming to church because they're offended and they do not acknowledge them when they, when they came back. And I'm like, how can we be so easily offended? As if I did it intentionally. You understand? Now somebody is offended to an action where you say, Pastor, I'm not coming back to church because how can I be away for all these months that I come back to church and you don't recognize me back to church? And I'm wondering, huh? So that's why you're not coming to church? Now that's somebody who is offended easily. And this generation is easily what? Offended. The things that offend you guys are petty. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor you're too petty. <laughs> <laughs> tell the other neighbor you are too petty. <laughs> Just say the spirit of pettiness, I rebuke you. <laughs> I'm serious. I was I almost got offended. I almost got offended that somebody is offended that I did not recognize them. And it disturbed me for a moment. And I was like, where did we miss? Where did we miss this thing? That you can be offended because the pastor did not recognize you. Praise God. Paul says, hereby I do exercise myself. I do exercise myself to always have a conscience that is void of offense. <laughs> In other words, you can ignore me how much you want. I'm not going to be offended. Praise God. 
You can ignore me intentionally or unintentionally. It will not provoke me to offense. The man Moses was offended by the children of Israel and it costed him. Those men who offended the man went into the world, into the promised land. The man who was offended was buried in the mountains. Listen, you can be offended by people. Listen, you will stay there and die. Listen, let me tell you one. Listen, let me say this again. Offense is the number one reason to why men are bitter. Bitterness is the root of all failure. It's the bitterness. It's the root of all sicknesses and diseases. If you're sick, if you go, if you just, if you just, you will not miss the root of bitterness. If you're always sick, if you just track and, and trace, you will realize there's an element of offense and bitterness somewhere. It is the root of all, listen, it is the root of all incurable diseases. Offense. You go ask a man called Hezekiah. He was offended that God could not come through for him when he was supposed to come through for him. When this king called who? The Sancharian, right? The Assyrian came against Israel. And Hezekiah did not understand why God was not coming through. You understand? And the man was offended and he caught a disease, an incurable disease. And God tells the man, listen, you, you're not fit to do this thing. Just put your house in order because you're going to die. Because men who are offended are destined to death. Offense is parts away, steps away to incurable diseases. Incurable diseases are parts away and steps away from death. Now I'm saying this. You must have a pure conscience. A pure conscience is a conscience that is void of offense. That's why Jesus says, be like little children, right? You can offend a little child how much you want, right? They forget after five minutes that you offended them. They forget after ten minutes that you slapped them. And they come back to you, right? As if you did nothing to them. Yeah. Because they don't carry things in their hearts. They don't carry misunderstandings. They, they don't imagine that the reason why you beat them is because you hated them, right? They don't want to imagine. Some of you, if somebody, if somebody uh, 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 reprimanded you, you have this imagination in you that the reason why they reprimanded me is because they hate me. You think you are reprimanded because you are hated. Children don't have that heart that the reason why Papa beat me is because he hates me. No. They forget very fast even why they were beaten. Praise God. Amen. Now let's define faith. Let's define faith. Because I want you to understand faith. But like, listen, you cannot walk by faith if you do not carry a pure conscience. Pure conscience is the first step to walk in faith. Now faith is the ability to see the end of a thing. It is the ability to see the end of a thing. Faith is going to the end of all things and, and then begin from the end and make that end the beginning of all things. If you ever understood that, then you qualify to serve or to lead in a church. I'll say that again. Faith is the ability to see the end of things. It's going to the end of all things and begin from the end and make the end of all things the beginning of all things. In other words, a man of faith goes to the end and then he makes the end the beginning. So a man of faith begins from the end. When we say that he is Alpha and Omega, he is Alpha and Omega because he begins from the end to go to the end because the end has become the beginning. To God, the end is the beginning. That's why we call him Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end because he is the God who in the beginning was at the end and the end was the beginning. 
Praise God. So faith is the ability to go to the end of all things. It's the ability to see the end. Praise the name of the living God. Give me this James chapter 5. Let me show you. Concerning Job. And listen, this is the only reason why Job survived the tragedy that came against him. Now listen, if you're not a man of faith, you cannot survive tragedy. Listen, I'll say that again. If you're not a man of faith, you cannot survive tragedy. You can't survive tragedy. If you're not a man of faith, you cannot survive tragedy. That's why when this thing came against Job, the wife told him, curse God and die. Why? Because Job's wife could not see the end of the calamity. He could not see the end of the tragedy. He only saw where they were and what they were going through. In James chapter 5 verses 11, um, James. You there? Verse 11 says this. Behold, we count them happy which endure. And please underline that word endure because I'm coming back to that word. Which endure. He says, you have heard of the patience of who? Job. And have seen the end. You have heard of the patience of you have, you have seen the, sorry, you have had the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. What that scripture means is this, that the reason why Job was patient is because he saw the end. Job saw how it will end. That's why when the wife said, curse God, he said, hey, he said, this has nothing to do with who? God. This has nothing to do with God. Because some of you have been taught that if something comes against you, God is what? God is involved. God is responsible. God was not responsible for Job's suffering and for Job's misery. But for men who don't see, always see God as one who is involved. And that's why we ask things like questions like, why me? If God is who he says he is, why would he let me go through this? Why would he let these things come to me? As if it is God. I like the scripture in Isaiah 54 that says that if an enemy attacks who? If an enemy attacks you, it says God says, I'm not the one. If anyone comes against you, God says, I am not responsible. Because there are things that have come against us, but because we are too blinded to see where they're coming from, we ended up concluding that God is responsible, or at least he's involved in our undoings. So Job says, hey, 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 when I saw the end, I was patient. When I saw the end, I endured all things. He says, we see the end of Job. That's why we have Job 42, just go, go, go Job 42. Very fast. Um, Job in 42, it's in verses 10, it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And please take time and read through the story. You will see that Job was a man of faith. The man could see that 20 years later, everything that I have lost now, I'll have back. Five years later, everything I don't have right now, I will have. They'd been taken away. They were, everything was taken away from Job because of ignorance, but he knew. He knew how it will end. Because men of faith know how things will end. Because they have gone to the war. They have gone to the end. Listen, you must learn to go to the end of everything and know how it will end. Like some of you know how those Niger movies end. I know you know in the beginning, you almost know. When the song for beginning begins, you just know. This one will marry this one, right? <laughs> <laughs> you just know this one will be bewitched by this one, right? You know. You see, that, that knowledge of knowing how and who will do what, that's what you need in faith. Amen. You know, some of you guys know. You start yeah. watching movies and you know. Do you guys know uh, movie stars never die, right? Yes. It doesn't matter the crisis that I mean. You, 
You are always have this feeling they don't do what? You just. The staring never dies. Which movie has the staring died? The staring never dies, right? Yeah. So you guys know how Niger movies ends. Now, because, listen, there is always an end of all things. And you can actually go to the end of all things and see how things will end. Listen, when you go to the end of all things and see how all things will end, listen, that is what it means to live by faith. So that when you get into a relationship, you know how it will end, right? You know that these idiots is playing games with me. Because you've already gone to the end, and then you've come back, and then you've asked the man, so what do you want? I want you to be my wife. But dude, I've gone to the end. I saw you leaving me along the way. <laughs> you already saw. Praise God. You get into a deal and you know this guy is going to, to do what? He's going to con you. So when you're getting into, you you already know, you already know, you already know how it will end. Some of you guys behave as if you don't know how it will end. You always know how it will end, right? You know it will end in tears, but you still get into those places. But something you told me, this thing will end in what? It will end in tears. There is something you know that tells you this thing will end in pain. But because you don't like red one, Red flags make them look pink. <laughs> or green, right? Yeah. But there's something in you that communicates to you and tells you that this one will end ugly. But we have a way of ignoring those things and working around those things and trying to, to hand fall the hand of God. So, you see, we said this on Friday. Lot, if Lot saw what Abraham saw about Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot would have never lived, lived him. He would have never lived, lived Abraham. Because when Abraham lifted his eyes, he saw that Sodom and Gomorrah was a city that was earmarked for destruction. He saw. But Lot insisted to go there. That's why, listen, from the day Lot left, Abraham was never told. He was never at peace. Abraham was never at peace. When Lot left for Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham was never at peace because Abraham knew the end of that city called Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew it was destruction. He knew that that city was going to be destroyed one year, two years, ten years, twenty years, fifty years later. He knew because he saw it. But do you think Lot is the kind who could, be, could have been advised then? No. I, I had somebody yesterday saying that five kinds of people cannot advise in this country. Do I mention them? <laughs> you know that, right? Yes. A woman who is in what? <laughs> listen, listen. There are people you can't advise. Even when you see the end and you tell them the end of this thing is going to be disaster, they would rather die than listen to you. And that is the tragedy of many, even today in the body of Christ, that we have a church that cannot be instructed. You cannot tell somebody you cannot go there. Because if you tell them you cannot go there, they have this idea that you, you are refusing them to go where they want to be. In Psalm 63, there's a man called Esau. Go there. Psalm 63. Three. There's a man called Esau. Esau used to observe the wicked, like many of you do, right? And you see how the wicked live large, right? You see some wicked guy. You see some wicked guy living in a very posh house, right? Driving big cars, owning mansions, doing well. You see some wicked guy. And you look at yourself, you say, But God, me, I'm your ward, I'm your daughter, I'm your son. I pray. This man don't even do what? These men don't even pray. And yet they have things you are praying for. You see, that's the, that's, the, that's the tragedy. And that's the mystery. That you are praying for things other men don't pray for. Let me tell you, by the way. When I understood this, I have never stood before God to pray, things for, pray, to pray for things that we can only pray for. I swear in the name of God, I don't stand in the presence of God to ask God for things the wicked don't pray for. 
Anything a wicked man has, I cannot stand before God to pray for it, to ask God for it. I can't. Because these people have things we even call Keshas Dua to pray for. Yes. We can even fast for 100 days to have things a man has, not because he fasted even for two days, and yet he has them. Now, Asaf, in Psalm 73, he was caught up in observing the lifestyle of the wicked. And in verses 1 it says that, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Again, that word clean heart, even to such that have a what? Pure conscience. Listen, God is good to men who are not offended. That's what that scripture means. It says that, to such as of a clean heart. God is good to men who have a conscience that is void of offense towards God and men. God is good to those kinds of men. And then he says in verses 2, but as for me, he says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well high sleep, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph did not see the end of the wicked. He saw the prosperity of the wicked. And because he saw the prosperity of the wicked, his feet almost slipped up. The man was almost dead. The man was almost gone. The man was almost, in fact, not almost depressed. He was depressed and he was on his way out because he saw the prosperity of the wicked rather than see the end of the wicked. And it disturbed us up until he did one thing. In verse 17 it says, Until I went into the sanctuary of the Lord, then I understood I their end. Now the moment Asaph understood the end of the wicked, he stopped envying the wicked. Why? Because he went to the end of the wicked and he saw what the wicked would become 10 or 20 years later and he came back and he said I want nothing to do with what I see the wicked possessing that's what I'm saying faith is the ability to go to the end or to see the end and after you've gone to the end you make the end your beginning so Asaf made the end the beginning then says I will start here because I have seen what becomes of the wicked 20 years later. In fact, there's a scripture in Psalms. Go, go to Psalms 37. There's a scripture in Psalms 37. I'll just read faster. In Psalms 37. Um, 37 what? 37, 17. Sorry? Not 17. 37, for, let me read from 35. It says... I have seen the wicked in great power. Please note. He says, I have seen the wicked in great power. This is, a, this is still a sum. He says, I have seen the wicked in great power. And spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away. Yet he passed away. He says, and lo, he was not there. I sought for him. But could not, but he could not be found. He says, that man I saw yesterday, today I went looking for him, and I could not see him. The things I saw him with yesterday, today he has none. Now, this is a man who has gone to the end. Now he's not moved by what he sees. Praise God. Listen, a man of faith is not moved by things they see with their naked eyes or their natural eyes. You have to go by your spiritual eyes to the end of all things, to see the end of all things, and then make the end of all things your beginning. Now, that is faith. That is faith. I told you, once I went in my house, we put that song. 
you know that so that wedding song? We have already gone to the end of my, my daughter's wedding, right? So now we, we sit in the house and practice. You know the way people dance? <laughs> you know the way people dance in weddings, right? <laughs> now we put that song and we begin to dance. And then I hold I hold what? You know the way I hold the hands, right? And we go. And we go to the wall. Why? Because we have gone to the wall. Now you are telling me. Some some idiot comes tell me your daughter is dead. How? I have got I've seen her getting married. What are you? What are you? What do you mean? She's dead. I saw her getting married. I saw her building houses. I saw her going abroad. What do you mean? My son is dead. What? What, what do you? Mean? You cannot go to the end and see the end of a thing and then somebody comes in between and gives you what? Listen. You cannot see your child pass and then you're, t- you're told that your child has done what? Has Faith. failed. And you believe it. You can't. The problem is some of you see your children in coffins. Yeah, that's a fact. Some of you, you sit down and you begin to see your children in coffins. You even begin to do what? To mourn, right? You put on, you put, you put on a black coat. Black clothes attend your people's weapon, burials and, and all those things. Why? Because you have seen the end. And the end is death. Rather than life, you have seen that the end is death. Listen, the end of sickness is not death. Do you guys know that? The end of sickness is not death. That's why he tells Martha and Mary, tell Lazarus that this sickness will not do what? Will not end in death. Because the end of sickness is not death. Your problem is when people get sick, you begin to see what? You begin to see that you're the one who kills the, you're the one helping the person to die because you're seeing the end of that person. The end of a sickness is not death. Sickness were never meant to kill no one, no man. I said at least two weeks ago, no sickness has the authority or power to kill anyone. No, no, no. There is no sickness on earth that can kill. When you hear that somebody has succumbed to a disease, it's a lie. Sicknesses in themselves don't have the power to kill. We give them the power. We are the ones with the power. So we give those things the power to do to us things that they do not have the power to do. We are the ones who see the end of things. It's called wrong vision of things. It's still in the realms of faith. But we are seeing the wrong things. Praise the name of the living God. Amen. Amen. Now, listen. A man of faith. Listen, there are three things I want you to take note. Now, write these three things and never forget these ones. If a man sees the end, they can endure anything. That's number one. If a man can see the end, they can endure anything. The reason why many of us cannot endure anything is because we do not carry the vision of the end. A man who sees the end can endure anything. That's why the apostles could endure anything. Listen, when you see the end, you can endure insults. People can insult you how much they want. It doesn't do it. It doesn't move you. Some of us are so moved by insults, right? Yeah, we cannot endure insults. We cannot endure to be ignored. We cannot endure to be left, to be abandoned. We cannot endure to be forsaken. We cannot endure. Why? Because we have not seen the end. Give me the scripture. Hebrews chapter 12. See, with the Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. A very powerful text. It says this. Therefore, see, I like the way he puts it. It says, See, because it talks about it talks of men of faith. Therefore, see, see, see. We also are are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. He says, "Let us lay aside every weight and sin which thou easily besets us. Let us run with patience. Patience is for men who understand the end." The rest that is set before us. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was 
set before him. What did he do? He endured. He endured. Why did he endure? Because he saw the what? Who was the end? You were the end, right? The end was your salvation, right? Yeah. He says, I cannot do, I cannot do this thing halfway. Because if I do this thing halfway, these men might never be saved. These men might never be perfected. These men might never be justified. These men, now, so the man endured the disobedience of the disobedience. And in that realm of disobedience, the man was even obedient to death. The man was obedient to death. He endured because he saw the end. He saw the end of sin. He saw the end of generational curses. He saw the end of poverty and failure. He saw the end and he said, I have to endure this thing to end failure in their families. To end failure in their homes. I have to endure this thing. He says he endured the cross, despising the shame and he sat, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He says, he sa verse 3 says that, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. Let me tell you, those two words, faint and weary, is for men who have not seen the end. Men who have not seen the end are always worried. Men who have not seen the end are always fainting. To this end, he says in Luke chapter 18, to this end, I gave a parable that men ought to do. Pray and not what? Faint. Not faint. Men faint because they don't see the end. Men worry because they don't see the end. You don't see how it will end. Many of us don't know that it's supposed to end in our world. In our favor. For all things work together for good. good. It's supposed to end in your favor. But because you do not have the eye to see that even though it's working against you right now, it is meant to work for you. Amen. That's why a man Joseph, it doesn't matter what a man goes through. He knows it will do what? Yeah, it will good. end in his favor. favor. The man was despised by his brothers, almost killed by his brothers, made a slave. He was, he was accused of doing things he had never done. And yet the man saw the end. And because the man saw the end, he could endure anything because he saw the end. I say this again. If you have not seen the end, you cannot endure anything. You can't endure anything. Anything could come against you and turn you against yourself to destroy you or to destroy your business or your career or your marriage or your family or your children simply because you have not seen the end. Praise the name of the living God. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Number two, if a man sees the end, they can entertain anything. If a man sees the end, they can entertain anything. Jesus entertained the accusation from men and he said nothing. You see that? When a man has seen the end, you can entertain anything. People can say anything they want to say about you or against you. It doesn't move you. It doesn't push you. It doesn't disturb you because you know it does not define you. Praise God. But some of us worry so much, right? About things we hear people say about, about us. us. They may give us sleepless nights. You sleep thinking, how could she say? How could he say? Why would he say? Why would he say that I am? Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say I am? He did not ask them to seek for men to define who he is. He already always knew who he is, right? Yes. Yeah. So people can say what they want to say about you. Whether they are true or they are, they are false. Whether they are right or they are wrong. What people say about you should never worry you, even for the second, even if they are true. Always remember, truth is only what God says about who you are, not what men say. So men can say what they want to say about you, but truth is only what God says about you. Praise Jesus. You can entertain and you can you can you can you can afford to entertain crap from men if they have to throw it against you. Don't be moved by things people say about you. Praise God. Amen. Learn to build a thick skin. Because men will always do what? Do you want me to tell you things people have told me about you? 
Do it, sir. <laughs> Thank God. I was delivered. I never sit down to listen to men telling me things about men. That's one of the things I refuse to do. I don't have time to sit down to hear a man coming to me, telling me things. There's a woman who came to me to tell me something about the husband. I asked that woman, this is your husband you're talking about like this. You'll go home and sleep with this man, right? I said, you'll go, and you'll go home. And you have the audacity to say this nasty, even if it is true, you cannot say these things against about your husband. You can. I told that lady, you can't. Even if it's true what you're telling me, you cannot say this. Praise God. Number three. If a man can see the end, they can end anything. And this is the most important one. If a man can see the end, they can end anything. The reason why many cannot end things that they are dealing with is because they don't behold the end of the things they are dealing with. Please write that down. The reason why men can't end the things they are dealing with is because they don't behold the end of the things they are dealing with. First Peter chapter 3 verses 15. But I'm not going to turn to that text. I want to turn us to the story of David. For 40 days, the army of Israel is unable to end the war in the valley. Praise God. So for 40 days, Israel and, 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 and what? And Philistines have been at loggerhead. Every day, the, the, the giant of God called Goliath comes out and he insults Israel. And he speaks against Israel. And he mocks Israel. And he utters things against Israel. And these things that this man called Goliath utters against Israel makes Israel to do what? To shrink. And these men are hiding. Why? Because of the things. You see, men, men can say things against you and, they, and send you hiding, right? Yeah. And for 40 days, every day, the champ of God used to turn up and insult Israel. And Israel would go hiding until a man who knew how to end things came. And when David showed up, a man of vision, a man of faith, he saw the end. Praise God. He saw the end. Praise God. The only reason why David ended the war is because he saw the end of that war. And guess what David saw? He did not only see victory, but he saw Goliath for who Goliath was. You understand? Many of us, we think Goliath is a war. He's a giant. He saw that actually Goliath is not a giant he claims to be. Because some of the things you are fighting, they are not what those things have presented themselves to be. You are fighting things that have appeared like impossible when they are nothing. Let me tell you, one day, by the grace of God, as you continue to grow, God will open up your eyes to see in the realms of the spirit, and you'll be ashamed that you fought battles you're never supposed to fight. Because it was not even worth fighting those battles. Yeah. Because they were nothing. And yet the things that are frustrating you, and yet the things that are pushing you down, giving you sleepless nights, when you see them for what they are, they are not even worth your second. They are things you're just supposed to ignore with a word. You know those things? You know the way you, some of you are good at... How do you how do it? I know some of you know how to do it good. I'm not asking. I know the way you know, you know how to do that kind of thing. That kind of thing. No, that kind of thing. Yeah, that one. You are just supposed to, to, that was enough to deal with that devil. You just ignore it because it's nothing. David looks at God and he sees what? Nothing. Because in the realms of the spirit, listen, what appears huge in the physical world could be too tiny in the spirit world. No. What appears huge, let me show you. 
Isaiah 14. Isaiah. Uh, uh, and please take time. Go read it in different translations. Huh? Isaiah, I said what? 14, right? In Isaiah 14, it speaks about the man you called Lucifer, the devil, the adversary. The Bible says in verses 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. That's the devil saying. Yet thou shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. See what that means? He said, this is the devil who is saying he wants to ascend to the highest throne and be God. And then God is telling him, listen, you are not who you say you are. He says, yet thou shall be brought down, devil. Thou shall be brought down to the hell, to the sides of the pit. And then he says, they that see thee shall do what? Do you know things that we not only look at? In other words, something that you can not only look, it means that if you are not careful, you can do what? If you are not careful, you miss it. In other words, you have to put the devil in a what? In a microscope for you to see him. Now, that is the idiot that is frustrating marriages. He's the guy who is pulling down nations. He's the guy who is making sister against sister, brother against brother. He's the one who is making churches not to grow. He is the one responsible of all the madness in the world. And yet the Bible says that if you see him from who he is, you might need a microscope to really look to see him. If you see the devils you are fighting for what they are, you will not waste your time. Praise God. That's why David looked at God here. Yeah. Uh-uh, he said, this one doesn't need a what? Javelin, right? This one doesn't need a what? A spear, right? This one does not need a what? An AK-47 rifle. I just need a what? A stick. And a what? And a stone. That's why Goliath looks at them and say, who do you think you are that you're coming to me with a what? With a That's stick me. and a what? Because as, and then he asked David, he asked David, Am I a what? Am I a dog? By the time Goliath is saying, Am I a dog? It means Goliath was actually what? He was actually a dog. <coughs> For David to choose a sling, he must have seen Goliath as a dog. Other men saw him as a what? Yeah. As a giant. When they entered the promised land, they were never supposed to see giants, right? Mm. Yeah. They were never supposed to see giants. Because Caleb said that those things you call giants are bread to us. They're supposed to be like what? Things we can eat. Now, at what point have they become giants? Now, we are the ones like grasshoppers. Now, they are the ones with giants and yet we are the ones who are supposed to eat them like what? Like bread. We were supposed to chew them like bread. Listen, you can make that thing appear so big when actually it's what? It's nothing. It's nothing. Let me tell you, the things you're fighting are actually nothing. The demons and the devils you're fighting in the name of cancer and high blood pressure and diabetes and I don't know what, 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 they actually nothing. You are the one who is giving those devils too much attention. Learn to ignore those things. Do you know one, one best way to, to kick the devil out of your home is to ignore him? Learn to ignore some of these things. You observe lying vanities too much. And the devil loves men who observe lying vanity. Even if I saw my child's nose running, I look the other side. Some of you cannot. You know what? Yeah. Because you're too conscious of things you should never be conscious of. We easily observe things we're not supposed to. We see things we're not supposed to see. And then those things we're supposed to see, we don't see them. <coughs> we observe lying vanities. And that's the only reason why David ended that warfare. That day, 
And like I always say, it's not because Goliath was too big for him not to miss. No. Sometimes we were told uh, that Goliath was too what? He was too big. There's no way David could have missed him. No. David beat him like a dog. You understand? Yeah. Because in the spirit realm, listen, you may appear too small when actually you are what? I've told this on Friday. You are actually an edifice. You are actually like a what? You are like a tower. You understand? You might appear too small, but in the realms, you are a big man. Or you may appear too big here, but in the spirit, you are too small. Too small. Too small. That's why we work out our spiritual lives every day, that we may grow inwardly as we grow outwardly. This is the mystery of faith we ought to behold with a pure conscience. That we can actually behold the end and see the end of all things and go to the end of all things and make the end of all things the beginning. When a man sees the end, he's never worried. Listen, I'm not worried about this year, even for a second. Praise God. Because I've gone to the end of this year, right? And I know how this year will end. And it will be good. Amen. Let me tell you something. I've said this before. Because I've gone to the end of so many of you, I have seen that none of you here will ever be diagnosed with cancer. Amen. That's what I know. Amen. Because I have a record. Amen. In new creation realities, we don't bury people. Amen. We don't bury people. We don't. I say we don't bury people. Amen. We don't bury people. Amen. Because in this ministry, people don't die. Amen. Our children don't die. Amen. Our people don't die. Amen. Because we have learned to go to the end of things. I know how the end goes. I know the end of it. I know where you will end. Yes. I know your end. I know how I will end. Then I can confidently walk any day. I can walk any time because I know stray bullets cannot kill me. Amen. I cannot die in the hands of a witch doctor. Amen. But he, 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 he went up country and then I don't know what happened and then something happened and then he died. How? 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 No. How? It's not possible. Why? Because we are men who have gone to the end of all these things. Amen. Let's be honest.